This week we're going to uh, be in, in Matthew 23, 37-39 a little bit. Uh, and that's where Jesus makes a statement. Uh, and I'll go ahead here and, and, and read 37-39 uh, of Matthew 23. Uh, it is written, and I'm reading in the New King James Version. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! the one who killed the prophets and the stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Jesus said these words at the conclusion of his earthly ministry. When he, during that ministry, he saved he healed. He delivered. He told people the way to God. And ultimately he was presenting himself as the Savior. He didn't say, I have the truth. He said, I am the truth. And Jesus was preparing to fulfill the last part of his earthly ministry. And that was to lay down his life on the cross. To shed his blood so that we could be delivered from our sins. Now many Jews that were his contemporaries accepted that message. They embraced him as the Messiah. Like the songs we were singing with the Lord being the, the, the Savior of Israel, the King of Israel. Jesus was the rightful heir to the throne of King David. And there were prophecies in Samuel that David would never cease to have a man sitting on the throne. And Isaiah 9, 6-7 confirms it, that uh, there was going to come a king who was going to reign forever. The government of the throne of David would be on his shoulders and he would rule the entire earth. Jesus is this Messiah. He is this King. He is the prophet. He is the priest. He is the King. But the Jewish leaders rejected him. They would rather have their arrangement with Caesar. They would rather trust in Caesar to protect them. And there's a lot of dirty politics that happened on their part to get Jesus crucified. So in this context, this is what, why Jesus said that your house is left to you desolate. The, lead, the Jewish leaders rejected him, so he was saying, you're not going to see me anymore. Until he says this statement, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said this in Hebrew, and that's where we get the words, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. That's Hebrew for blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a reference to Psalms 118. And the rest of my message is going to be an analysis of what this chapter is saying. And this chapter is loaded. And I'll, I'll go into it bit by bit here. Uh, first of all, the first four verses. And I'll read them here. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, His mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. These are general praises to God that His mercy endures forever. God's mercy, God's program is not like man. Uh, with things on the earth, it's here today, gone tomorrow. James says that life is like the grass, blade of grass in the field. It's here today, tomorrow it withers away. That, that, that is our life, our, our earthly life. Even earthly kingdoms. Uh, at the time this was penned, you had Babylon as a major kingdom, Egypt was a major power. When Jesus came and said what he said, the Roman Empire was a big empire. Those empires are on the ash heap of history. But the kingdom of God lasts forever. And he unveils this into three layers here. The first layer is the house of Israel, the, the ancient nation of Israel. Then he says, let the house of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood which has now been morphed into the priesthood of Melchizedek and in the New Testament. Which is why they're the things that they, the way they did some things back in the Old Testament we don't do anymore because there's been a change of covenant. But the mercy of God isn't limited to a single covenant. It transcends all the covenants. It's present in all the covenants. And this says, let those who hear the Lord say, now say. And this is everyone, not just to the native Jew, but to the Gentile who is grafted in, who has come into this covenant with the Lord through Jesus Christ, through his shed blood on the cross. 
And so this is a call for everyone to praise God for his mercy. And the rest of the psalm is going to go into his mercies. And particularly what's going to happen in the end times. We are called to seek the Lord because it is better to trust the Lord than man. And it's so easy to trust in man. Israel would tend to trust in the princes. And today in the modern age we do no different. So in the entire political election we hear all kinds of spin why we should trust this politician or why we should vote for that politician. But, and this could very well say here, it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in politicians. Because that's the message here. And I'll read here in verse 5. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me, set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore I shall see my desire upon those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. To put it, to, to translate it for today, you know we should say, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in politicians. We are in an election year. And I, I know who I'm going to vote for. But my trust is not in that man. My trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. For years, the Israel has trusted in princes. They made these uh, treaties with Babylon, with Egypt. And in those treaties, they compromise themselves. And in the church, we're doing the same thing. There are those in the church who put their trust in the Democrats. They put their trust in Obama. There are those on the Republican side that put their trust on the Republicans. There are those who sing the praises of Gingrich. There are those who sing the praises of Romney. There are those who say that Ron Paul is our only hope. But I am here to tell you, Ron Paul is not our only hope. There is one name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. We are to put our trust in the Lord. Israel, modern Israel, puts her trust that America is going to save her when surrounded by all these armies. There are those in Israel who put their trust in the 200 to 300 nukes that Israel has. The nukes aren't going to save her. America is not going to save her. The Lord Jesus Christ, her Messiah is going to save her. And, and because Israel has not yet learned that, the Lord is allowing circumstances to be worked out where she would be surrounded by the nations. And that's the context of this psalm. When Israel was surrounded by the nations, that she would put her trust in there. She would, for the first time in 2,000 years, seek the Lord her God. Seek for the Messiah to intervene. And I'll read here in verse 10. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. In other words, they were all around. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. You pushed me valiantly that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. This is talking about when Israel is surrounded by the nations in the end times. And last week we went briefly to Joel 3 where it talked about how God was going to draw all nations down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. In other words, we're talking about Armageddon. And this war is also referenced in, in Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39 that there would be multiple wars. Some of these wars we could see in just a few years. The events of the Middle East with all the revolutions going on in some of those Islamist countries, you have one regime and each of them being replaced by another. So we could be dealing with an entire coalition of nations surrounding Israel in just a few years, fulfilling these very prophecies. But in the midst of these prophecies, where Ezekiel talks about uh, Israel being surrounded by the nations and God intervening in judgment, Psalms 118 is focused on the worship of the Lord. It's focused on seeking the Lord. And let, let me continue here. Uh, salvation, Israel's going to find us through praise and worship of the Lord. In verse 14, we see a shift here. It says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Israel's salvation during this time is because she seeks the Lord. It's because she undergoes sacred assemblies. It's because the people of God, because while Israel is surrounded, 
The church is going to be in a matter of speaking surrounded. The church is not in a geographic area where we would be physically surrounded, but in all the nations that are surrounding Israel, there's going to be hostility to the people of God. And so this also applies to the church. We are to look to the Lord as our strength and song, and He has become my salvation. What that means is that as we seek the Lord, as we worship the Lord, as we offer up praises, He manifests Himself. He reveals Himself to us as our salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation, according to verse 15, is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. That's symbolic for referring to God's strength, His power. Right hand is symbolic for military power. The Lord reveals His military power. As we worship Him, and a number of confessions are made here, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go to them. I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. This is a reference to Psalms 100 where it says, We shall enter through his gates with thanksgiving our hearts and through his courts with praise. It is through praise, through worship that we enter the gates. For I will praise you, for you have answered me. For you have become my salvation. God is calling us now to seek him through praise, through worship. Through proclaiming the word of God in song. As we did here this morning, and God had came. And we saw manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly in the middle of a song, I burst out in laughter because the joy of the Lord hit me. And there was a time I had to put my hand against the wall because I was having a hard time standing up. And the joy of the Lord is in me now, even as I preach. But as we worship the Lord, and we see this through Peter, uh, for, not Peter, but Paul and Silas, when they was in prison, they worshiped the Lord in Acts 16, the chains fell off. In Jericho, the musicians led the army. Who heard of musicians leading an army? But that was the command of God for the musicians to lead the army. The walls of Jericho fell and the battle was won. So, our response as we're surrounded by the armies, as Israel is surrounded by the armies, as persecution rears its ugly head, is to praise the Lord, to trust in the Lord for our salvation. And here we see... Jesus revealed as God's answer. Jesus is the blessed deliverer who comes in the name of the Lord. And verse 22 through uh, 24 it says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in 1 Peter it talks about that. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's referring to Jesus. It's referring to the fact that he was rejected by the Jewish leaders as the Messiah. They rejected him. And later on put out, made it in the Jewish religion a heresy to believe in Christ as the Messiah. But that stone which they rejected, the one that their leaders conspired to reject, that is the one who God has chosen. God put him in this chief cornerstone. And what God is doing in this time is he is arranging events so that Israel will once again recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus as the King of Israel. They will start to say, Baruch Habal Hashem Adonai. <coughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will be seeking God for salvation. They will be saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. You have given us life. It says, Bind the sacrifice with cords on the horns of the altar. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. They look to Jesus as the Savior, as the Deliverer, as the Messiah. And they do this as they're surrounded by the armies. As the Antichrist rears his ugly head, they proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, as the Lord of all the earth, as the prophet like unto Moses, as the high priest of our confession, one who ever lives to make intercession for us. As we look to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as we proclaim him the Lord of the earth, 
when we're surrounded by the armies, when persecution is all around, when injustice seems to roll with no deliverer, we look to Jesus as our deliverer. We proclaim Him as our deliverer through praise, through prayer, through proclamation of His, his Word. When, when the world is breathing down our neck, when they have the sword to our throat, we boldly proclaim Christ as King. We will see the salvation of the Lord. And I will give my, conclude my message by saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. For his mercy endures forever.